Well, remember when we do a, a number line, we just want to give uh, a, a correct idea of the scale, where the numbers are in relation to each other, in relation to zero, if it's uh, practical to put a zero there. So we'll put a zero so that you're indicating to me you know, you know the deal with negative numbers and positive numbers, negative numbers you can think of as on the left side and positive numbers on the right side. Okay, and three is greater. Um, why is three greater if we look at these two numbers on a number line? What's that? Uh, any number that's to the right, even in the negative side, if we had a negative 12, your negative 12 would be larger than negative 13. It would be less of a deficit, which would be a larger number. Okay? Um, so, any questions on that? Okay. 21. Um, negative 4.99 is a rational number. Now, remember that a rational number is uh, is any number of the form A over B, where A and B are uh, integers. integers. So what's an integer? Because we need to know that to know this. What's an integer? box there and it shows you whole numbers and integers and rational numbers, also irrational numbers. So you should have that in your notes or in your memory if you can write down in your notes. What's that? Um, an integer is not a decimal. Yeah. It's what? Well, there's whole numbers and there's integers, so it is a difference. Okay, so we're getting there. Like whole numbers being not decimals, not parts of numbers, not fractions, uh, in the sense that we usually think of fractions. Uh, numbers like negative one, negative two, zero, one, two, those ones that are not partial numbers, they're complete numbers, and they can be negative or they can be positive. That's what integers are. So any integer divided by another integer, as long as this integer is not zero, uh, makes a rational number. So let's say a negative 4.99 is a rational number, but I don't see that. I don't see a fraction. Right? I don't see one number divided by another. But could we write this number as a fraction, as one number over another? How can we do that? Negative 4.99 over something. Oh, okay, yeah, and over something. Here we are. Kind of killing it this morning. Yeah. One hundredths, right? Ninety-nine one hundredths. Negative four and ninety-nine one hundredths. Now, and definitely four is could be written as a rational number. We could write this as negative four hundred over uh, one hundred and ninety-nine one hundredths. Right, we could add these together, make it negative negative four hundred and ninety-nine one hundredths. So there it is. It's a rational number. We can do that with any decimal that, what? What enabled us to do that so easily with that decimal? What if it went on forever and ever and ever? Would that have been so easy? No. So if it ends, for sure that'll be easy. You just write that number over whatever position the last number's in. This was in the hundredths position, so 99 over 100. This guy right here, for example would be 987 over what? 1,000, because this is in the thousandth position. Right. Anything like that can work. Any decimal that repeats, it could go on forever, but it could repeat, uh, say, 987 forever, right? That line means like that, 987 repeats forever and ever and ever. That can be done, that can be written as a rational number. Um, Anything other than that, anything that uh, other than a decimal that terminates or that repeats forever, anything other than that can't be written as a rational number. Anything other than that in the world of decimals, at least. 
So we see here we have a decimal that terminates, it ends, so it can be written as a rational number. That's the reasoning there. Okay. Five. Um, well, all these numbers that we're going to be working with for at least a while, they're all going to be rational numbers. Okay. Irrational numbers are pretty special. They don't come up when you uh, just divide one, uh, one number by another. Uh, they're, they're kind of special, like pi and e and all these different uh, numbers. So they're all rational numbers, so we can definitely start uh, there, rational number. Um, it's an integer, okay, because the integers are, like we said, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, so on and so on, both directions. That works. Um, even more specific than that, we got 0 and the positive integers are called what? The whole numbers, right? So that's why they even more specifically say it's a whole number. Okay. 16 thirds, rational number. Clearly not an integer. If it's not an integer, it couldn't be a whole number. So it's just a rational number. And 5.1, negative 5.1 is a rational number because we just discussed how if a decimal terminates, we could just say, well, that's negative 5 and 1 tenth, and we're on our way. So, let's see the answer here. Well, negative 5 in sum is definitely going to be more negative. It's going to be smaller than negative 4 point anything. Negative 5 is smaller than negative 4. And if we tack something onto 5 and we tack something onto to 9 still, the 5 is going to be smaller. Negative 5 is going to be smaller. Um, and... How do we know 16 thirds is bigger than 5? Yeah. This is 15 and 1 third? Okay. So we're almost there. It's not 15 thirds. This is going to 15 feet of me. How many times? And how, so how many holes? Five, so it's five and one third, right? Right. So we're going to turn it into a mixed number. Uh, we'll we'll find the, the largest number that's less than sixteen. The three goes into evenly, goes into fifteen. Fifteen divided by three is five, and you got one third left over. There you go. There's a perfectly good way to figure out that that is a little bit bigger than five, and so we should divide it uh, to the right of five. Okay. Well done. Well done. Okay. So here's a, and I want you to find negative a, and what's this? Yes, jada, right? I just needed to confirm that I remembered a name. So is that what you're going to say? Absolute value. Okay. Caleb, absolute value. No, it's okay. I will try and call on raised hand. Um, so if this is a, <coughs> and we want to find negative a, I like when I'm going to replace a, a variable with, an, with a number, just put parentheses, so that I'm sure that nothing gets left out. If there's a negative sign or there's a, a fraction or, or something, um, the whole thing makes it in there. So A, right, this is the part where we're trying to find negative A, negative, negative 3. We're saying the opposite of 3 there, right? The opposite of the opposite of 3. What's the opposite of the opposite of 3? And when we do the absolute value of a, absolute value of negative 3, what does absolute value mean? Jada. It's the positive of the number. OK, positive of the number certainly gets us there. Certainly will get us that it is 3. And what is that? That positive 3 is It's measuring something that the absolute value tells us. Is it like a more technical, I guess, definition? Uh, the distance from 0. Distance from zero, which same thing, right? Really, it's the positive of the number, uh, whatever that number is. It's just that measure of the distance from zero. Okay. <clears throat> so I put this guy in here. It's 
fairly basic one, but um, just making sure we, we get that we've got this number negative one and we're adding this number six. When we add negative one and six, we should get five. Right? We could also do six minus one, same thing. If we did, instead of negative one plus six, we did six plus negative one or six minus one. What property is that that we're using? Could be associative. Is it associative? Or is it, what's the other one? How do we, we always know that. It's either associative or it's commutative when we're talking about those kinds of things. So how do, how do we decide which it is? explanation to you about commutative? Or did we have time for that? Did we get to commutative? And associative? Oh, okay. Well, here, let's jump over here. Um, so A plus B equals B plus A. That's what we just said about, said about that last problem, right? Negative 1 plus 6 or 6 plus negative 1. It's the same thing. This is commutative. What's the root word of commutative? Commute. What does it mean to commute? To who says move? You said move? Okay. To move, yeah. If I commute, it means that I move. I commute to work, I commute back home. Some people commute from Florence to Missoula, some people commute from San Diego to LA, but they're moving, okay? So you see why that might be a good fit for this property? Because the letter, the, the, not the letters, but the numbers move. They actually switch positions. The A goes over here. Okay. Even if you just remember this, that commutative means that the numbers actually move and change positions, that would be enough. The other one must be associative. Right? But there's a, a reason to call this associative. Okay. How many numbers can you add together at once? Only add two. You cannot add three. Because right? the truth of it is, you have to add two together, get the result, add something else, get the result of that, add whatever. If you want to add a bunch together, it's always two at a time. So, which two do we start with? Do we start with these two, or do we start with these two? The truth is, it doesn't matter. Okay? What's the root word of associate? Of associative. Okay, give it away. Associate is the root word. What does it mean to associate? Do people associate? We did do this, didn't we? I thought so. Associate means to work together. Okay, so these two are going to associate. They don't need to move to do that. They just need to kind of turn their attention to each other. They're going to work together, and then C will work with whatever the result is. Or B and C could work together first, and then A could come into it. But there's no movement required. Right? Commutative. Commute means to move. There's movement in this property. A and B switch positions. Associative, it just matters who works together with who first. Um, but in the end, it doesn't make a difference. They're equivalent to each other. Okay. We did do that. We work together. So uh, negative 1 plus 6 or 6 minus 1, still going to get 5. Okay? 35. Negative 2.6 plus negative 3.4 plus 7.6. Uh, you can put these negative numbers are pretty easy to put together. It's going to be negative. Uh, the 2 and the 3 together are going to make 5. What about the 6 and the 4? They're going to make 10, but they're, they are tenths, right? So there's 10 tenths. So it moves up. 10 tenths is the same as 1, one unit, right? So this is going to be 5, 6, and 4. That's going to make another 1, so that's going to be negative 6 plus 7.6, and 7.6 minus 6, 6. Okay. Any questions about anything that we've done on this quiz? Does that mean you ask a question? Practice in the fly fishing? Um, do you have a Uh, all right, 
Any questions from any other part of the homework that you had trouble with? Looks like, okay. And that makes sense, you know, it's the beginning of the year, it's review for the most part. If you don't have any questions, that's fine. If you do have questions, don't be afraid to ask them as simple as they might sound, okay? Right, so if the time comes, if you do have a question, Unless you plan on coming in outside of class, which is fine. That's what I used to do. I didn't like to ask questions in class. I didn't like to answer questions in class. I was very quiet. I took my notes, sat there, and if I had questions, usually they got answered because somebody else luckily asked a question, or I went in outside of class. So that's up to you, but make sure you get those questions answered. All right, let's take that homework and pass it in. Collect it. If you don't have your homework, what should you be handing in? Pink slips there and there. If you don't have your homework ever for any reason, you want that pink slip. Even if you're absent, even if your grandma got sick, even if your dog ate your homework, even there we go, we got them all. Not a sick grandma, I guess. There are two spots. They're there, and they're over there. They're back by the printer in the back of the room. They're over by the door as well. It's all the same thing. four from this row. All right, so we're going to be in 1.1 to start this morning. So you can take out your books and open that up to 1.1. So, I'm going to help you see the reason for, for things. So, um, 
if you'd like to in math, shorten the notation of things if at all possible. So uh, let's say that at the beginning of math, and of all math and all of history, uh, we probably started with something like this, right? dots, or uh, some of the earliest mathematical artifacts are notches and a bone, and a bone with notches, and that's how they're counting things. Okay? Uh, but fast forward to the days of Fibonacci in the early 1400s, and we bring in Arabic numerals, okay? which is what we use today. This shortens things up. So there's a lot of shortening going on, but we have made the leap from nine dots to what do we now do? If we want to do some math and represent this. <clears throat> you write nine? You write the number nine. You're done. Okay? And here's another, let's say a separate set of nine. There, make it a different color. So there's another nine. Right? So now we write another nine. Okay. And here we have a nine with another nine combined with that nine. Um, so that's, that's great, but then in a mathematics, how do we represent that we have a 9 and we're going to combine it with another 9 and that there's a collective of 9 and 9 in one place? You write 18. You write 9 plus 9 is 18. Yeah, we have a new, rather than writing this big group of dots, we have a number that represents how many dots that is, 18. Okay. So now we have numbers, we have addition. Let's do 9 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9 plus 9. Now, we can keep doing that forever, right? But we want to shorten it up. We want to shorten up the time that it takes to write down all these dots. We just write the number 9. Okay. Now, if we want to shorten up 9 plus 9, we want to repeat this addition a bunch of times. What's faster to write than that? Nine times six. Nine times six. Okay. They mean the same thing, but we want to take up less space on our paper, so we write nine times six rather than nine plus itself a bunch of times. Right? So now I can do this as much as I want. I can write down nine times anything, and it will represent that I've added it together a bunch of times. Uh, well, let's, we got this guy right here, 9 plus 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 9. How would we write that? Yeah? 9 times 9. 9 times 9. Okay, okay well, so we've got this thing that multiplication really is, in, in the truth, 9 times 6. It just means repeated addition. Just adding the same thing over and over and over and over. Well, what if I want to do 9 times 9 times 9 times 9 times 9? Now we're running into this kind of the same problem. We're going to write multiples of 9 over and over and over and over. So, how do we represent that? Right? 9 to the 5th power. 9 to the 5th power. Okay. Nine to the fifth power. Okay. So, multiplication is repeated addition. And what are these things called? Exponents. Exponents. And we also use what other word? You said it. To the what? Power. Power. We call them powers. We call them exponents. OK? So and this is just a shorthand for something that we you know, wanted to do over and over and over and over. So exponents are repeated multiplication. which is the multiplication is just repeated addition. So exponents are just repeated, repeated addition. So now we've hopefully clearly defined what exponents are, in case there was any confusion at all. Okay, so if I were to take x, some number x, to the n power, 
How would I say in words what I would write down? X to the power of n. Right, that is how I would say this, x to the power of n. Power of n. Um, so that's how I'd say it. What, if I wanted to write what it equals, like here we have 9 to the fifth, we have what it equals. What would go on the other side? What does it mean, x to the n? Okay, n means x times itself that many times. Um, let me show you, let's see. Let's say two to the third. I just wanna, this is what we've been taught. Two times itself, three times, right? Okay, how would you write two times itself? Two times two, two times itself. So that's just two times itself. And then two times itself, Two times, like it's kind of redundant. Two times itself, two times. So if this is two times itself, two times itself, two times, would mean like maybe this twice. Oh. I think that wording is confusing. I'm confused. Usually it's a different number. Okay. How about three? Uh, okay. How about nine? We'll go with nine. Start over with nine. So nine squared. That means. Nine times itself, two times. Right, that's, what we, that's what we often say, nine times itself, two times. Well, this is nine times itself already. What does nine times itself, two times mean? How would I repeat this again? Um, or nine times itself, three times. Well, this is nine times itself, like once, right? So this, Nine times itself once, maybe this is like maybe twice. Nine times itself twice. I think that wording is confusing, it confused me. If it confuses even one person in here, or if I've just confused you because I brought it up, let's just say this differently, okay? Instead of times itself twice or times itself three times, let's just say uh, two factors of nine, or three factors of nine. Or, in the case of n, what goes over here? What, is it, what does it mean instead of x times itself n times? n factors of x. n factors of x. That's what we could write on the other side. Now all of this is equal to n. So n factors of x. I like that because it's very precise and it uses math, jargon, like factors. Our understanding of the word factors is going to be pretty crucial throughout our time in algebra and all of math. It already has been crucial, and maybe you didn't realize it. Okay, so what is a factor? How do we define a factor? How about this? Um, give me a factor of 15. Um, without saying it goes into it, without using that kind of, what does that mean, generalized, goes into, right, we're going to define it better. Without saying it goes into it, why, what's your proof that 3 is a factor of 15? No, not goes into, no, no using goes into. There it is, right? 3 is a factor of 15 because, the reason is, 3 multiplied by 5 gives you 15. Right? No other operation, no addition, no subtraction, nothing else, only multiplication. You can only be a factor if you multiply by something else, and that's it, and you get the number that you're a factor of. Okay? So 2 factors of 9 means 2 9s multiplied together. Uh, 3 factors of 9 means 3 9s. They're factors, factors. That means you multiply them together. N factors of x, that means uh, x times x times x, and, and a bunch of x's are multiplied together. We get down to the end, and we multiplied n of them together. Okay? Did I beat that dead horse enough? Got that idea. Okay. So that's factors. Uh, that's that's.
That's exponents and factors we've talked about. Um, so, I think you'll get that just fine. Um, so what we'll do is we'll talk about, say, x to the fourth. What does that mean, x to the fourth? Okay. So we're multiplying things together. We have factors here. How many factors? Four factors of, of x, okay? So that means x times x times x times x times x, okay? Um, so if I say that x is 2, now I'm telling what, what x is worth, then what is x to the fourth? x is 2, then uh, 2 to the fourth equals 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. And we can do them one at a time, one pair at a time. 4 times 2, that's 8. Multiply that by 2, you get 16. So we've got 16. Okay. So I want you to, um, to work on this next one by yourself. It won't take very long. You need to write it down, write it down. If you need to do it in your head, do it in your head. Now all I'm going to do is tell you an x value, and I want you to tell me what uh, that to the fourth is. So I'll just let x be negative 2. Okay, don't shout it out. Work on it on your own. Really do it. Really have an answer that you can defend. Uh, if you're thinking of it in your head and you can't defend your answer, write it down so that you can defend your answer. Be able to defend it. So, how many of you say negative 16? Okay. How many of you say positive 16? There's more than that number of people in the class. So how many say negative 16? And how many of you say positive 16? Okay, got a lot of positive 16s. Okay. Um, can somebody tell us why it's positive 16? So here is the thing that could happen. It doesn't look like it's happened to many of you. Uh, we are going to multiply x by itself four times, which means this. So we could just put it in here, negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. The mistake that gets made a lot is we'll replace x with negative 2, and we'll look like this. All right, That's not necessarily incorrect, All right, but it is kind of confusing. Um, it's a little ambiguous. Did you ever watch that PEMDAS video in here? You said we didn't do commutative or associative either. Did we do the commutative? Huh? Didn't watch the video. I think I think that's right because we we uh, had an assembly. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring that up. I'm gonna watch that. I like videos, and I like this guy. He's pretty smart. Okay. This. Now there's going to be an add. Just going to have to deal with it. If you went to elementary school in the U.S., or much of the rest of the world, you almost certainly learned about something boringly called the order of operations, a set of rules for whether or not you should do multiplication before addition or addition before subtraction to get the right answer on your math test. Except you don't always get the right answer, or even one answer. I mean, is 8 minus 2 plus 1 equal to 5 or 7? And is 6 divided by 3 divided by 3 equal to 2 thirds or 6? 
The problem is, focusing on the order of operations can lead to ambiguity and obscures the real, underlying, and often beautiful mathematics. A mathematician will tell you that 8 minus 2 plus 1 is really 8 plus negative 2 plus 1, which is unambiguously equal to 7, even though the so-called order of operations standard in the US tells you the answer is 5. If you want 5 for your answer, then you really need some parentheses. But why is this ambiguity even possible? It's because, fundamentally, all of these operations are simply different procedures that start with two numbers and combine them in some way to give you one number. Each operation takes two numbers as input, two and no more. If you want to be entirely unambiguous and pedantic, every single pair of numbers in any algebraic expression should be inside parentheses, and then there's no need to know any order of operations. Just evaluate the innermost parentheses first and work outwards, collapsing them down pairwise like a championships bracket. But it turns out that's not the only way. It's possible to change the order in which you do the operations, to rearrange the parentheses, as long as you know what the underlying mathematics is. For example, if you want to add 3 plus 4 and then multiply the result by 5, you can either do the addition first and get 7 times 5 equals 35, or you can do the multiplication first, as long as you know that multiplication distributes across all the terms in the parentheses. That is, 5 times 3 plus 5 times 4 equals 15 plus 20 equals 35. The same answer. And how do we know multiplication distributes? One way is to draw rectangles, but I've done that before. The same rearranging can be done for exponentiation and multiplication. 3 times 2 all squared, or 6 squared equals 36, is the same as 3 squared times 2 squared, 36. It even works for addition and subtraction. 5 minus 1 plus 2 is 5 minus 1 minus 2. So the true order of operations is this. Use parentheses and learn what exponentiation, multiplication, addition, and the rest are really doing. Then you can proceed however you want. That's not to say that we don't have a conventional order of operations in mathematics. I mean, deciding that we evaluate multiplication before addition allows us to get rid of lots and lots of redundant parentheses. And noticing that 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 1 plus 2 plus 3, and 2 times 3 times 4 equals 2 times 3 times 4, removes a ton more. But the point is that those parentheses are still there, still implied, just like how 3 minus 4 is secretly implying 3 plus negative 4, and 3 divided by 4 is really 3 times 1 fourth. But anytime the result might be ambiguous, you really need to use parentheses. Then you can proceed in whatever order you want. The order of operations learned in school, however, is different. It's a mechanical set of instructions that dictates just one of the many ways you can do algebra. It locks you into a single path through the beautiful mathematical landscape, which, while necessary for a computer whose goal is merely to give you the right answer, doesn't really give any insight onto what it is that you're doing when you do algebra. So while the order of operations isn't technically wrong, because most of the time it'll give you the standard answer, it's morally wrong, because it turns humans into robots. This Minute Physics video was brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in- Yeah. Um... So you think... That that turns you into a robot? It does. If you don't think it does, you're wrong. Hello? tell you why it turns you into a robot uh, by describing an interaction that I have with a lot of students. They'll look at a problem, or they'll be asking me help with a problem, and they'll say, am I supposed to do this? Am I supposed to do this? Am I supposed to do this? When they start their questions like that, uh, it's a robot's view of the world, right? Uh, the robot says, or the computer says, you know, give me input give me what I'm supposed to do with them, and I'll do that. Okay. Um, so I want you to think about what you're doing, what makes sense uh, to do. Uh, if we look at, at this problem, negative 2 to the fourth, um, if this to you in your notes means, right, if it means negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, then fine. Right? That could be confusing um, because the way it's written, I could also interpret that to be a negative. 
uh, times the result of 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Right? So it's a little bit ambiguous. Is it the number 2 raised to the fourth, negative 2 raised to the fourth power, or is it the number 2 raised to the fourth with a negative in front of it? You see what I'm saying? Right? Kind of ambiguous. And I see this on tests and, and homework a lot. I'll see this notation, and they do it correctly. But even the same person on the same problem going back and looking at this will confuse it with that because it's ambiguous. They weren't specific enough. Okay? So just to be careful, just to be very specific, uh, so there is no ambiguity, there is no way to confuse what you're supposed to do, what should you use? The order of operations that we currently use would tell me to do this. It would tell me this is 2 raised to the fourth, this is multiplication by a negative 1. Right? I do exponents before multiplication. So I would do this if I were following strictly m. How can I make sure that negative 2 gets included in the fourth power? This means four factors of whatever is right here. The way it looks right now, it looks like just a two is right there. How can I make sure that a negative two is right there and it applies to the four applies to all of them? What? Parentheses, a beautiful, very common grouping mechanism. Okay? So there is no way to confuse this and wind up getting this. There's just no way. I want to take four factors of, and we've talked about how that's the notation for having four factors of whatever this is, and this is negative two. So definitely, there's no confusion there, or shouldn't be. So there's no if, there's no way to get this. So the purpose of parentheses is to not leave it up to the reader as to what you mean, okay? Uh, I, I took a, a traffic control school, um, and they said, that the one thing you don't do is give people who are looking at the cones and stuff that you set up, you do not give them any choices, okay? Uh, lots of people have been injured or killed because they were set up right here, so they're in a, in a sewer, right? they're working down there, and then they set up these cones, and they figure, hey, I only need to be in this lane, so I'll just put up cones here, Right, diverting traffic around it, and then people can either go this way, and then they can go this way. They can choose, and they can figure it out. But what happens is people don't pay very good attention. They're not quite sure what's going on. It's kind of ambiguous, and sometimes they wind up driving right through the cones, just as somebody pops up to see what's going on, and they get hurt. Right? So don't leave it up to the reader. Don't leave it up to the driver. Don't give any choices as to what you can do with these numbers. Uh, put parentheses around stuff if you want to be really specific. Okay. But then, you know, he does go on to say, it's not to say that there's not an order of operations that we do use. Okay. We do use an order of operations in uh, much of the world. But even still, this can happen. So I want you to, um, Write that down on a piece of paper. Uh, also, like say, grown and complete just a little bit if you manage that. Good. Uh, I just want you to do it. What? What is it?
guy named Patrick on YouTube. <coughs> and uh, he does uh, on the online tutorials. He sits down and you can see his hands writing and he explains things like physics and calculus and you've done down to arithmetic. Uh, he explains a lot of different things and helps people to understand those subjects. Um, so I like to see how he does, he does things. Maybe I can borrow from him, maybe I can borrow from Khan Academy and that kind of stuff when I do videos like I do. Um, and he put this problem up one day and said he got stuck on it and got confused and didn't know what to do. And I just thought, that's weird. This guy, if he knows calculus, should certainly be able to do a problem like this. So I, I, I did it. I got 288. Okay? And I thought, of course, that's what you're supposed to get. 288. And then a, a bunch of people were getting two. Okay? And those are the two main answers. So I got 288. Am I, am I correct to get 288? Sure. If somebody got two, are they wrong? Okay. That's a good answer. Um, I'll show you. But first, I'll uh, tell you that below the video, and I was I happened to see this not long after he had posted it, and just a few hours, there were over 500 comments of people getting really nasty and vulgar about their arguments over whether it should be 288 or two. Insulting each other, saying you don't know anything about basic math, you should go back to fifth grade, all these different things. It's like, wow, this is really a bunch of rude people. Um, and so the way that uh, you can get the two different answers is uh, I think most people will add the nine and the three together first, and most people do that, so we'll, we'll do that. Two times Um, so the difference between getting 288 and getting 2 is this. 288 is like this. 48 divided by 2, 24 times 12, 288. So how do we get 2? Yeah? Multiply 2 by 12. Multiply 2 by 12. Forty-eight divided by twenty-four is going to be two. Who's right and who's wrong? Yeah. Order of operations says divide first. Does it? It says to divide first. Let's look at it. P E. What's M? Multiply. Divide. Add, subtract. Okay. So. Again, I'll ask you, who's right? 288 right, it's two right. They're both right. They're both right. How can they both be right? Depending on what? Are they following the order of operations correctly? Depending on how they learn it. Depends on how they learn it, and that's the only thing it depends on. Right? It doesn't depend on anything else other than how they learned it. Or the two arguments that I saw were, this is how I learned it, okay, and people explaining their understanding of PEMDAS uh, and trying to get people to understand how they're right. And other people trying to explain, no, you do it this way, okay? So some people saying, look, multiplication and division are the same thing. Multiplication and division are equivalent. Division is just multiplication by a reciprocal, just multiplication by a fraction. So you just do them from left to right, right? So if division comes first on the left, do that first, and then whatever you see next, do that, and then do that, and do that, okay? But other people say no, it's understood, multiplication comes first, so multiplication is first. You multiply before you do any division of any kind, okay? There is no right and wrong there. It's just that this is, they're arguing about what agreement was made. In one set of math classes, an agreement was made to do it from left to right. Division, multiplication, it doesn't matter. In another set of classrooms, it was agreed they would do multiplication before anything else and then division. Okay? And then the same with addition and subtraction. There's, there's that. With multiplication, division, one is a more heated debate. Okay? You can go on 
Patrick JMT. And I find this was uh, over a year ago, so you have to sift through and find. The, the, the screen looks like this, I think. It has that problem written on the screenshot, so let's try that. I won't share the comments in class because some are quite filthy. Um, so what it comes down to is there's not a group of people who are right and a group of people who are wrong. Two, people, two different groups of people who were just taught two different ways and the truth is, about this, well, if you wanted to get two, what's the truth about this expression here? If you want everybody to get two, then what could you say about this expression? Obviously, people didn't get two. There was several of you got 288, some of you got two. <coughs> If I intended for you to absolutely get two and for this expression to be equal to two, then what do I need to do? You have to go left to right. I would have to either assume that you're going to go left to right, or if I didn't know what you were going to do, it was a little bit, it was up in the air. I don't know who's going to do what. What would I need to do to this expression to make sure that you had no choice? Whether you move left to right or not, you're going to have to get two. What I want you to do, I want to make sure that these get multiplied together first, and then you divide 48 by the result. So how do I ensure that happens? Do you have to put the 2 and the 9 in the same quantity? Yes, exactly. If you want this to become a new number, then you need to group it as if it is one number with parentheses. So we definitely want the 9 plus 3 first, or to distribute the 2. Okay, if you don't know about the distributive law, we we're, we're still have yet to cover it. So we can distribute the 2 to the 9 and the 3, and it will still come out in the end to be 24. Or we can add 9 to the 3, multiply by 2, and we get uh, 2 times 12, which is also 24. If I want you to get 2, I have to put parentheses. If I put parentheses there, there's absolutely no way you should be getting 288. So you have to take the parentheses away, ignore them, and then do division by two, okay? So the truth of it is, mathematically, if I take away the parentheses, there's not a right way and a wrong way. The fact is, you can, you can word a sentence poorly, like this one. I guess we can capitalize this. Okay. Now, does that sentence make sense? No. What are we trying to say? Let's eat, Grandma. Let's eat. Grandma, let's eat. Grandma? Time to eat. Right, it's time to eat. Hey, Grandma, it's time to eat. Let's eat. And there should be a print. Posture, right? uh, let's eat, comma, Grandma. But if you take the, the comma away, you're saying, let's consume our grandmother. She's sick. Okay? So. It's the same kind of a thing over here. If we don't use our punctuation correctly, the result could be ambiguous. Okay. Now, like I said, that's not to say that, there's, that we are always going to put parentheses around every single pair of numbers. Do you remember him doing that? He did that. Oh, let's find it. Uh, no. Oh, there it is. Well, he put parentheses around every pair of numbers that he wanted to have priority, to be operated on together. Um, we're not going to do that, right? Like I said, uh, or maybe not have said yet, but mathematicians like to use as little ink as possible. So they don't want to write all those parentheses all the time. So we created and we agreed to this order of operations, not because it's mathematically correct, but because it's nice for shorthand. It's nice to write things with less ink than uh, a bunch of parentheses would require. Um, and it, yeah, it helps us write things shorter. Okay. So here's how we'll do it, and I'll write it a little differently so that um, it's less confusing, less ambiguous. Okay. 
as two from top to bottom, an actual hierarchy where one thing is above another and some things are not above each other. So parentheses definitely work within the parentheses first if you can. Then do exponents, that'll work great. Uh, multiplication and division here on the same level, okay? So the actual the way I'm writing is, con is conveying that they're on the same level. Then addition and subtraction also on the same level. So this would mean from left to right. Okay, so what that's trying to convey is that the only hierarchy is from top to bottom. If you're on the same level, it's the same. Divide, multiply, whatever. Whatever comes first, okay? And that's important because um, if we're to, to write things down, we do need to agree on some standard, okay? So that'll be the standard. But here's something about my class. All right. This is the order of operations that I learned. It's how I do it. I use it to get 288. That's what I thought it was until you know, I started to realize, oh, there isn't a right and a wrong here. Um, it's how the calculators that we use, uh, these ones, the TI-83s, 84s, and so on, that's, how, that's the order that they would follow if we put this into the calculator. 48 divided by 2 times 9 plus 3. It interprets it as 48 divided by 2 first, then take that result, multiply it by 9 plus 3, which is 12, and we get 288. But the saddest, the saddest argument that I could hear from anybody that made me the most sad when I was reading these comments was my calculator got 288, or uh, Mathematica got 288, or um, any number of programs or calculators, Google, whatever, got 288. Okay? It's very common. I think this is more common than... Uh, multiplication first, but there are there's a significant group of people who learn multiplication is first before division. Okay. So the truth about this, though, if I were to put this on a test, and you were to give me two, and I would have gotten 288, I would just say, you know what? I did not write that very well. I'm not testing you on PEMDAS. I'm not trying to see if you know PEMDAS, like it's the right thing to do, and not doing it is the wrong thing to do. PEMDAS is just a, sh is a shorthand. Okay. It's a shorthand that, that I'll use so that I can write um, 2x plus 3, 2x meaning 2 times x. And assume that you know by the shorthand that we agreed on that you're not going to do x plus 3 first and multiply by 2. Okay? 2 times, the multiplication is going to come first and addition is going to come later. If, I, if you got 2 on here, I would just say, you're right, that wasn't a very well constructed expression, and I'll give it to you. I would give you 2. If that's what you got. That'll happen from time to time. One of my questions is poorly worded, and I'll either give it to people who got one of the two answers, or I'll just take it off completely, and you know the total score is is less. Um, so that's a little rant there. Uh, so in the end, what we're going to agree to, rather than using tons and tons of parentheses, is like this. Multiplication from left to right in a way that I would get 288. That's how this would operate. That's how it would work. Um, but if I construct an expression poorly uh, and you point it out, then good on you and I uh, really like that you did that. All right. Now. Now we're going to, in 1.1, do some simple evaluating of expressions. An expression is a combination of the operations, multiplication, division, addition, and subtraction, with numbers and variables. So 3x plus 2, this is an expression. And according to the, the order of operations, I would multiply the 3 times whatever x is, and add 2 after I'm done with that, and then x plus 2, and then multiply by 3. Um, so, if I evaluate the expression for x equals 9, what does that mean? If I want to evaluate this expression for x equals 9, what does that mean? What are you going to do? 3 times 9. We just take 9 and put it 
put it in here for x. 3 times 9 <coughs> plus 2. 3 times 9 is 27. Plus 2. Order of operations, I keep, I will keep talking about it because it's a good topic. But the order of operations tells us to multiply these first and then add this so that I don't have to put parentheses around those every time I want you to prioritize that multiplication. <coughs> so this guy right here, this is what we call. Algebraic expression. We could say algebra is the practice of letting numbers represent, or letting letters represent numbers. Once we start putting letters in there to represent numbers, we found algebra. Before that, you wouldn't believe how incredibly complicated it was. And maybe there's something even better than this that we'll do someday. But uh, before this, um, Euclid and others would use uh, just lengths of straight lines to represent variables, and then try and solve using a compass and straight edge. They didn't have the idea of 3x plus 2. They had three lengths of undefined length, like three lines, uh, plus uh, a known line that's two units long. Uh, it, was, it was a mess. It was a big, big mess. So, this is algebra, using letters to represent numbers. So if we want to evaluate, we just plug the number in. We already have plugged a negative number in for an exponent, which is pretty crucial. We've mastered that, I believe. So we have that. Let's go to 2.2. Uh, I'll just point out something. It's really more of the same. We've done most of 2.2. The rest of 2.2 has to do with evaluating expressions. We did chapter 2 before we did chapter 1 because chapter 1, it's kind of a hard thing to do, but chapter 1 says let's evaluate some expressions, which requires you to add, multiply, uh, subtract, divide, all these things. Well, then we come into chapter 2, and how does chapter 2 start? Integers and rational numbers. So. They, how do you evaluate expressions, which involves rational numbers and decimals and all that kind of stuff. And then in chapter two, they teach you about rational numbers and decimals. So it seemed kind of weird. So we did it out of order for that reason. So the last part of 2.2 .2 just involves the uh, evaluating of expressions. Okay. 2.3, we're going to put in there too, just subtracting numbers. Not that we haven't subtracted numbers already, but we define subtraction uh, formally. 2 minus 3. It's really the combination of two real numbers, 2, and what other number is being used? 2 plus what other real number? <laughs> Quiet. Mouthing that I can't hear. 3? It's, well, 2, I'm saying that this is equivalent to this. So 2 minus 3 is not the same as 2 plus 3, but it's the same as 2 plus negative 3, the opposite of 3. So that's all this really adds to the, to the discussion is that subtraction is really, if you think about it, addition of negative numbers. Just like division, like we'll learn in a, on another day, is multiplication by a fraction, by a reciprocal. Okay? Um, so is that, and we've already discussed fractions, adding fractions, subtracting fractions, gotta get that common denominator. If you don't get a common denominator, think about your answer, write out your answer. Think if that makes sense. Could 2 thirds plus 7 eighths possibly be 9 elevenths? Uh, well, draw a picture of it, it won't seem to make much sense. All right, gotta get those common denominators. We get common denominators because now we're talking about the same thing. When we get things in terms of uh, 20 fourths and 20 fourths, if that problem would need to go to 20 fourths and 20 fourths, now we can compare two like things and put them together. Um, make sure you get those common denominators. Um, so 
before you have to do that on your own, is there any questions about getting common denominators, why we get them, how we get them, anything like that? What was that? A little bit. So let's, let's do talk about common denominators, because they're going to get more complicated as the year goes on. And, and if we break them down to their simplest definition, then they'll kind of lose it. So, so let's just say we've all got a firm grasp on the fact that we need to find common denominators if we're going to add fractions. So let's take 2 sixths um, plus, uh, not 2 sixths, how about 5 sixths? <coughs> 5 sixths plus um, <coughs> 3 eighths. So this problem is to highlight the fact that what we really want is the lowest common denominator, not just any common denominator. Though any common denominator will work, uh, the lowest common de denominator is best. Okay. So let's first let's first define a common denominator. How would you define a common denominator? Not the lowest common de denominator, but any common denominator. How would you define that? Yeah. A factor. Wrong word, but you're almost there. Got a multiple, right? Yeah. All right. So six. Let's see. Let's say thirty-six is a multiple of six, and six is a factor of thirty-six. Um. So a multiple of both denominators. So I'm going to reword this a little bit. Okay. So this is absolutely correct, but I'm just going to use different words to rewrite it. So um, let's say a number, just a new number, uh, which both denominators. Okay, so this is just a number. We haven't defined it as a multiple. We're going to define that with different words. So it's a number, and both denominators, they both have something in common with each other in relation to this number. Both denominators are factors of. Okay, so a number which both denominators are uh, factors, factors of. And we talked about factors earlier. What does it mean to say that uh, 5 is a factor of 35? What's our proof that 5 is a factor of 35? What's that? Shout it out from the mountaintops. What's the proof that 5 is a factor of 35? Yes? 5 goes into 35. Okay, true. 5 does go into 35. But we got rid of that goes into kind of ambiguous notation of like those words. The proof is 5 times 7 is 35. 5 times 7 is 35, right? Okay. So. This new number, okay, don't start packing up. I still got five minutes. I'll be done. You'll have time. Don't be late, all right? Um, this new number, six will be a factor of this number. What else will be a factor of this number? Eight. Eight will be a factor of this number. I'm going to read lips this class. Okay? So there's some new number that is going to have 6 as a factor and 8 as a factor. And there's a way to go about this that is surefire, works every time, and makes sure that 6 is a factor and 8 is a factor. Okay. So we start by factoring 6 and factoring 8, finding all of the prime factors. So this is 2 times 3. Easy enough. Two prime factors, we're done. Okay. This is, say, 2 times 4. Okay. And 4 is 2 times 2. So 6 is made up of, of two factors, 2 and 3. 8 is made up of three factors, 2, 2, and 2. OK, you good on that? So if a number were to have 6 as a factor and 8 as a factor, then we'd have to have factors of 2 and 3, right? Because the 2 times the 3 make up the 6. So in this new number, we have to have factors of 2 and 3. And also in this new number, we have to have factors of 2, 2, and 2. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Well, let's just take these factors here of, of 6. Let's say 3 times 2. OK, if I, if I tried to say my common denominator was 6, it would work for 6. 6 would be a factor of this number, because 3 times 2 is 6. We also need this number, whatever it multiplies out to be, to have 8 as a factor. What do we need 8? What do we need in this number to have a factor of 8? We need to have 3 factors of 2. Okay. Now, we've already written down this number. What, what do we already have? We already have a single factor of 2. How many more factors of 2 do we need to make 8? Two more. Right? So this is 6. So is 6 a factor of this number? This is 8. If I take this separately, this, this 2 and group it in a different way, I get 8. So is 8 a factor of this number? Right? And let's say we do uh, 8 times the thing that's left over 3. What is this number? 24. So we made sure that 6 was a factor by including all the factors of 6. We made sure 8 was a factor by including all the factors of 8. And we didn't overdo it, like by multiplying 6 times 8, getting something much bigger than necessary. Okay. We didn't get redundant. If we already had a factor of 2, we didn't write it again. Okay. If we just did 6 times 8, we'd have 3 times 2, times 2, times 2, times 2, but that would be too much. <coughs> So that's one way to go about it. You almost made it without packing up. You do not need two entire minutes to pack up your bags. No, you don't. Okay? Um, that's it. There's your homework. You'll have it at the end of the day via text. It's on the website. I am a techno genius. Mm -hmm.